Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I have back on the podcast, Peter Kramer. Uh, Peter is a psychiatrist who practiced and taught psychiatry for over 40 years. Uh, He's also Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at Brown University. He's done extensive research on depression and antidepressants. He's written numerous books, including the classic, the bestseller, Listening to Prozac. And that is out in its 30th anniversary this year, uh, or just recently. And he, uh, he, we were been stayed in contact and, and I said, you know, come back on and let's talk about uh, kind of the book that really uh, put him on the map, so to speak, uh, publicly. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in our previous conversation, uh, but we spend all of our time uh, talking about uh, this book and this conversation. So we talk about the 30th anniversary, listening to Prozac, and uh, talk about antidepressants and kind of what we what we know over 30 years about antidepressants. We talk about the origins of uh, antidepressants, classes of antidepressants. Talk about the self, how do, do antidepressants impact how we see ourselves. Criticisms of SSRIs. Uh, this is uh, the type of uh, class that uh, Prozac is in. Uh, the serotonin hypothesis that sometimes gets some traction. It did a little bit, uh, I think, last year or a year and a half ago. Risk of suicide with Prozac. That was a big um, you know, feature warning at, at one point. The future of SSRIs and antidepressants more generally, and many other topics. Uh, always fun talking with Peter. He's obviously quite brilliant. He's very, very nice. Um, and uh, I really, really enjoy the way he thinks about things and kind of his tone and his approach for many of these topics. It's just very sharp, very clear. Uh, and, and again, just, just another wonderful conversation. So I was very happy to have him on again. As always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I am also on YouTube. Like, follow, subscribe, share with your friends, contribute. All of that's very helpful. Uh, make sure you listen to the other conversation I have with Peter and, uh, and, and many other uh, conversations that are similar to this. Uh, so make sure you check out the back catalog as well. And uh, now I bring you Peter Kramer. I am here with Peter Kramer. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. It's uh, it's great to thanks. it's great to have you again. Good to be back. Yeah, yeah. We had such a lovely conversation the last time talking about your novel you had put out. Uh, was that uh, Death of a what was the, what was the title again? I'm forgetting. Death of the Great Man. Of the Great Man. Yes. That's what it was. Death of the Great Man. Let's that's mention right. that as often as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, Death of the Great Man. It's all the help we can get. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great novel. Uh, we had a great conversation. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely link to that in the uh, in the notes for this episode as well. So it was great. And of course, uh, you know, you, you've written a, a few other things, uh, nonfiction as well. Um, and so the book we're going to talk about today is the, my goodness, 30th anniversary of listening to Prozac, the landmark book about antidepressants and the remaking of the self. Uh, this is uh, absolutely wonderful. I can't believe it's been 30 years. Uh, so yeah. So before we do, just uh, real quick, just remind folks of uh, you know kind of just who you are, you know your background professionally, and uh, we'll get into the book. So I've been a professor at Brown for uh, I guess going on 40 years, and I teach in psychiatry and human behavior. Uh, this was my second book, Listening to Prozac. It was a national and international, truly, bestseller. Uh, and more, it was a cause of discussion in the country. The New York Times, at the end of 1993, had a headline, Listening to 1993. So it was, you know, it was that kind of year where everyone knew what this book was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I think, helped introduce the medical views of depression and um, made depression more discussable altogether, uh, destigmatized it a bit. Although the intention of the book was a little different. It was to discuss observations I'd had as a practicing doctor. I uh, practiced uh, psychiatry in private practice uh, for most of those 40 years as well. And um, I had some observations that made me think that these then new antidepressants like Prozac, the the ones that affect the way the brain handles serotonin made me think that those were affecting patients' uh, personality traits, their temperament. That's what patients were telling me. So the book was really about 
the nature of the self, how changeable the self is, how we define the self, what we think is intrinsic to us, what we think is historic and experiential. And uh, so that was the intent of the book, but it got used as a sort of primer on depression and antidepressants as well. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So as I was saying before we started, you know, I, I went back and reread the book. Obviously, you have, a, you have an introduction for, for this year, the 2023 introduction, and there's also a, uh, an afterword as well, which I, also, I really like that as well. And so it's, it's nice because you, you, you stand by everything or, uh, that you say in the, in the book. It's still... Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't age poorly. Surprisingly, I mean, some of these, especially with antidepressants, there's things that have kind of been updated, new research. But you know, the book comes out '93, uh, and uh, there's. Uh, I guess this is. A, is this the third edition? Is that right? This is the third edition. It's yeah. I think it's probably the fourth in terms fourth. of new. I had two new afterwards. I had this wonderful opportunity. You know, what writer gets this thirty years down the road right, from right. Penguin to, you know, look back at the book? I did it introduction that talks about our cultural, the cultural role today of antidepressants, very different than it was 30 years ago, how we see them, mm. uh, a bit about how I came to write the book, what my qualifications were, uh, how I, my use of the medicines changed over time. Yeah. And then the afterward, which I found very interesting to write, mm. um, is more about the science updating anything that I thought needed to be updated in the book. And as you say, I was really relieved to see how well the book stands up. You could really mm -hmm. read this. Yeah. And in terms of the science and the conclusions and the ethical debates, you wouldn't be very far out of date today, 30 years later. I mean, that may not say much about the progress of psychiatry in the time. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think because we think differently about the medicines, because we use them differently, physicians do, patients do, uh, you know, the book would seem a little strange to write today, even if it's accurate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, we, we can talk about it there, but I do want to focus on, um, you know, obviously this idea of of the self and what medicines do to people in terms of personality or how they view themselves, things like that, uh, and all different types of uh, ways in which that kind of comes out. Uh, so maybe I guess a good starting point is, you know, you, you write about it in the book. How did we get... Well, Prozac, of, of, uh, first of all, but I guess just generally these kind of uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. Uh, you talk about the kind of uh, progenitor, the precursor, uh, what is it, uh, Ipranazide? Um, and, uh, and then we get to Prozac. So maybe just kind of talk about in, in pharmacology and the role of serotonin for depression and things like that. And we can talk about some of the more current debates about that. But initially, how did we get to antidepressants and this class of SSRIs that we, we, many people know? So in the 1950s, scientists found medicines that seemed to affect people psychologically. They were designed for very serious mental illness, really for schizophrenia. And a Swiss uh, physician who had access to these drugs to test in a large mental hospital found that some of them really weren't working for schizophrenia, but his patients came up and said, uh, you know, I'm obsessing less. I'm, you know, the nurses said they, they looked less depressed. And he wondered whether they might not be antidepressants, which was not even a concept at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, this doctor had been trained in existential uh, psychiatry and psychotherapy as I was in my time, although it meant something a little different then. And uh, really new to listen to his patients. He had a private, privately constructed notion of uh, depression. And he proposed testing these medicines to the drug company. The drug company was resistant. But one of the major uh, funders for the drug company had a wife who was seriously depressed and uh, got the company to, to try, release the drug to try with his wife. And he said to the company, they'd better pursue this because she did well on it. So that was, you know, the first set of antidepressants. They were based on antihistamines that were on the shelves of drug companies that had psychological effects. And at the same time, as you say, there were some antituberculous drugs that seemed to have the same effect when doctors gave these drugs. Uh, Ipronized was one to uh, tubercular patients. The ward became a pleasanter place and drug companies started looking into those for 
uh, depression as well. So those were the tricyclics and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And uh, those held sway for uh, until the late 1980s. And in that time, uh, you know, these medicines affected neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and um, uh, serotonin. Uh, these are chemicals the brain uses to communicate with itself. They, they move between cells, between neurons. And uh, scientists thought that these drugs didn't affect serotonin strongly enough. They were curious about if they, if they developed drugs that had less effect on norepinephrine, more exclusively on serotonin, what would that look like? There were reasons to believe they might make patients less obsessive. There was a type of depression defined at the time, a typical depression where patients slept too much and gained weight instead of, mm -hmm. as typically happened in the kind of depression that was prevalent then, losing weight and sleeping too little. They thought it might affect that. So they developed these medicines and Prozac was the first to come to market in the United States. Uh, and that brings us up to, you know, very late in 1987. Uh, and so I got to use the medicines in the late 1980s and early 90s and started writing about them in essays for colleagues. I had a monthly column in a trade paper, Psychiatric Times, and started writing about Prozac. And I I didn't think that I, what I was writing was terribly original. I was kind of saying to my colleagues, come on, guys and gals, you're probably seeing what I'm seeing. Mm. Patients are coming in. It's not just that they've gotten over the episode of depression or become less obsessive. They're also uh, more comfortable socially. They're more assertive, more confident. Mm. And my patients were saying these things to me, you know, in the way that uh, uh, happened early in the development of these drugs. I was... This only happens once, you know, in the career of a drug, sure. which is it comes to market. Mm -hmm. There were these serotonin reuptake inhibitors for the first time mm -hmm. uh, in the late early 80s, early 90s. And patients who'd never been on them before uh, got to say what it was like for them to be on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is such an interesting time because as you're, you're absolutely right. There's, you know, you only kind of get one moment for that. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of be right there. And, and you know, it wasn't. You know, 30 years uh, sounds like a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not a long time. It, it really is still relatively recent. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not 70 years ago. It's not a hundred years ago. It's 30 years ago. It's a generation right. ago. Sort of 30, 30 years for my book, 35 years uh, for the drugs. Yeah. And uh, yes, you're right. I mean, and, and also, you know, what's funny in medicine is very often the first drugs in a class that are developed turn out to be, you know, very useful. So it, you know, when digitalis, digoxin, you know, was discovered for certain heart conditions. I mean, there are a number of these drugs where it turns out the first ones, you know, they only get noticed. They only get into the pharmacopoeia because they work pretty well. And then it turns out to be hard to, mm. hard to outdo them, hard to do better than them. Prozac probably doesn't treat depression any better than a mepramine and hypernyza did, mm -hmm. uh, maybe less well. It's, but it, it turned out to have a number of benefits. And one is it was just better tolerated. Yeah. Uh, and the other was it's harder to commit suicide on. Mm -hmm. So that one of the problems with the early antidepressants was that internists and family doctors were reluctant to prescribe them because you were giving medicines you could kill yourself with mm. to people who were potentially suicidal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that made them reluctant. And also they had a lot of side effects that could cause there more changes more in your vision. Cardiotoxic, right? Or isn't that as TCAs were, uh, you're right? Well, yeah, I mean, they are and they aren't. But I mean, they, yeah, there were lots of, lots of potentially dangerous mm. effects. And internists left that to psychiatrists. They were, my yeah, guess based on articles from the time is about, in a given year, about two, uh, two Americans in 100, about one in 50. Mm were on an antidepressant at about the time Prozac came out. And now that number is probably, mm -hmm. instead of one in 50, one in seven. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, almost a power of 10 increase. And uh, it's because these medicines are well tolerated, but also because one of the kind of dreams of psychiatrists, which was to get treatment of depression into mainstream medicine occurred, that um, internists, family doctors, uh, GPs, obstetricians were willing to prescribe these newer antidepressants I mean, mm. for better and for worse. It may not be the best way to treat depression, but it, it does 
get more depression treated altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's these classes. So for people that may know, or may know a little bit of it, you know, when, 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 if you take a, what we would currently know now as a major depressive disorder or even certain types of anxiety disorders or, you know, for, for depression, they're, they're classified as antidepressants. They're not just used for depression, but they're used for anxiety, clinical anxiety as well. But you have the TCAs, which you're talking about. So your imipramine, your neurotriptyline, things like that. You have your MAOIs, which have some a, typical presentations and they have a lot of um, uh, dietary restrictions. You can't eat, you know, the fava beans and avocado and turkey and wine and cheese and things like H cheese. Um, but you know, you have these SSRIs and so you, people will know some of the names, obviously Prozac, uh, you have Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro, Selexa, et cetera. Uh, and there's a group, uh, the, the, these are the group of SSRIs and we'll talk about some of the impacts there, but just to fast forward real quick, we now have SNRI. So they work on two neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine, um, such as, uh, Cymbalta or Effexor. And, and then we also have the atypicals, uh, which is interesting because they work on at least two or three neurotransmitters, work for anxiety and depression, such as Wellbutrin uh, and, and some of the, the serotonin modulators. It, I guess the, my question here on this is after SSRIs came really on the market, late 80s, early 90s, and you had, you know, Flox or um, Prozac, and then you have all the other ones I listed. Have we really made any changes, uh, revolutionary changes, or are these just updates? So SNRIs or modulators or things like that, or is it just kind of like a, uh, like a, you know, instead of a 3.0, it's a 3.5, right? It's not, it's not like a full update. It's kind of, how, how do we see where antidepressants currently on the market are, as opposed to when SSRIs really came on the market 35 years ago? No, I think you're right. There have not been big changes that once we had Prozac and Zoloft came immediately after and the older drugs, we could cover most of the same territory we're covering now. I mean, it's true with more to choose from. Different patients do well on one or not the other and so on. And there are uh, different profiles of side effects so that if patients don't tolerate one, they may tolerate another. But in terms of the main effects, you're looking at pretty much more of the same. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, there's interest in different categories of drugs. So everyone knows about ketamine and yep. uh, psychedelics, whether question whether those work for depression. It's, there's a lot of interesting research. I would say it's not utterly convincing if you, you know, there's a lot of skepticism about uh, Prozac and Zoloft and Lexapro. If you're skeptical about those, you'll be really skeptical about the psychedelics. And of course, uh, paradoxically, that's not the case in the culture because people are so distrustful of drug companies, they're <laughs> much more willing to, to complain that, that Prozac isn't well tested and then uh, you know be interested in the psychedelics, which are really not well tested. I'll tell you about a funny experiment on those lines uh, later, maybe if we have time. Yeah. But, um, and then there's just some interesting other drugs. One I always mention is related to allopregnanolone, related to a hormone that changes in the course of pregnancy for uh, pregnant women. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just very interesting because it is either given in a very long sort of day and a half infusion in hospital or it's given by pills for 14 days. And then you're off it. And supposedly, we don't really know yet either, but supposedly it's been tested best for postpartum depression, but supposedly patients do well for, you know, six, nine months, maybe a year, and then probably would need another course. And obviously there haven't been a lot of patients who've been through this twice. We don't know if it works the second time and so on, but, it, you know, a lot not known, but it's just interesting to have drugs that are very different and not just different in their theoretical basis, but difference in, in how they're used mm -hmm. clinically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very different to be on a pill every day uh, and uh, have all the side effects that come with that uh, than to have something like, uh, you know, a trip on a psychedelic or mm -hmm. uh, ketamine plus some uh, psychotherapy that's, you know, meant to be very deep and transformative in the moment and then be off them for a while. And then this sort of more neutral drug uh, that you take for two weeks and then you're off it. And I think if these drugs really succeed and have broad use, 
we will have better knowledge about what it means to be on, say, Prozac chronically versus what opportunities there are for drugs you don't have to be on chronically. You know, how big a difference is that? Uh, and, it, you know, obviously the field would like to know in advance through, you know, blood or sputum tests, DNA testing or something, mm -hmm. who's likely to do well on one or another and who should just be seen in psychotherapy only and so on. So I think there are very interesting times ahead. But the funny thing about the future is you don't know. <laughs> uh, and it may be that we did, you know, the field did pretty well with amipramine and hypernized and, uh, and, uh, Prozac and Zoloft, and it's not going to be that easy to, uh, you know, expand the efficacy of our treatments. It's, we just don't know yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, criticisms of uh, antidepressants and SSRIs more recently, which we'll come to in a minute. But I guess before we do that, in the beginning, and so you talk about this in the book, first couple of chapters, and it was it was really nice to kind of read that again. I, I hadn't I hadn't uh, thought about it in this way, so it's, it's really almost in some ways kind of like going into a, a really cool time capsule in some ways. Not that it's not relevant for today, but just the kind of um, the newness of it, I guess, the novelty of it, which was really cool to see. Is when Prozac came out, people that were depressed, clinically depressed, they seemingly weren't. Their symptoms were uh, would would uh, would remit, and they were they were much much better. And and it, you, you pose this question in the book, which I've thought about at different points too. Is is who's 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 the real self in here, right? If if somebody needs, let's not say a dependency, because there's you know that's more of a you know, kind of a, a substance dependence kind of thing in a clinical way, but more of a a regular. Um, uh, taking of, of a medication, but to, to impact mood that much where you would feel more normal or balanced or regulated or whatever. And that unless I have this antidepressant, I can't, or it's very hard or, you know, I can't regulate, you know, uh, my moods or my emotions the way that I, I need to. Um, the question becomes like, well, who's the real me here? Who's the real self here? And so I guess maybe talk about, you could talk about the, the kind of um, pharmacology of it if you want to talk about the action of it and things like that. But more so the question is, is how do we understand when people take these meds and they're able to be regulated and balanced, you know, what does this do with our notions of selfhood or how we understand who we are uh, and who we're not when we're not on them? Well, let me say how that, developed for my patients at the time, yeah. because I came to think about this through them. And they were patients who probably had been treated for depression before, and they would have these episodes where you get uh, sad and hopeless and despairing, maybe suicidal, have it slowed down in general. Depression is very impressive when you see it. Yes. And I would put them on the drugs and uh, if they were responded well, they would get better. They'd come out of the episode and that would have happened to them before. And that happens in time for most people with no treatment. It happens more quickly, probably with psychotherapy and with medication, but these were patients who didn't respond to other things and now they were responding. So that didn't surprise them, but they would come in and say, you know, doc, there's something else going on, which is I think of myself as a little obsessive and ruminative and withdrawn and uh, socially clumsy. And I've changed on all those fronts. And that's me, you know, that's who I've been my whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were two ways of saying what that difference was. One was to say, you know, maybe those traits are not inherent to me and they're not related to you know, my ongoing response to how I was treated in childhood or how other kids treated me being bullied, whatever it was. Um, and uh, the other was to say, no, this is me that, you know, I, uh, I compared to having a migraine, which is you have a, a migraine chronically, you know, month after month, and it's relieved. You say, I'm myself at last. And that's what my, certain of my patients were saying, mm -hmm. as if they never would have been themselves if this medicine hadn't been discovered. Yeah. And then, you know, what is the medicine doing chemically without getting into it? 
you know, whatever is going on with serotonin is the, it, serotonin helps regulate dominance hierarchy in animals, groups that are regulated that way so that people had done experiments with monkeys where they would give the dominant monkey a medicine that inhibited its brain's uh, handling of serotonin and give another monkey Prozac and the monkey giving Prozac would be more likely to become the alpha male in the troop. Hmm. And, you know, they found the lobster closest to the food supply was a high serotonin lobster. I mean, this is really throughout the animal kingdom. One of the problems that scientists worried about lightly, I would say now, is that the first part is not light, which is that these medicines get into the water supply a lot. So we are polluting the environment with uh, these antidepressants and their byproducts, you know, from disp disposing of pills, from urine, whatever. And uh, crayfish, given that amount of, you know, the amount of uh, Prozac that's in the water, become too bold. They expose themselves to harm. Uh, you know, based on, on the serotonin. So that, that sense that these medicines could change personality, that was really what I wrote about in listening to Prozac was, look, we develop these medicines for depression, but the main thing serotonin is doing in the animal kingdom on this psychological basis is changing boldness and uh, changing sort of leadership position. And we're, we're getting, as humans are getting some of that effect, patients are getting some of that effect. Uh, and as you say, it ra raises the kind of questions that my patients raise, which is, on the one hand, are some of these more inhibited traits biological happenstance? And on the other, are there people who have some inherent sense of who they are and never get to be that person until they're on the medicines? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think that I've also heard the same thing in, in clinical practice, uh, you know, where... People will say, you know, my psychiatrist is, is prescribing this and I feel, I felt like I, this was me, but not that, that kind of thing really comes to this idea of, you know, I mean, this is sort of my opinion, right? You know, I mean, you and I are both, you know, old school Freudians, I think so, you know, but my thing is that there's, you know, the idea of personality is, you know, layered, right? It's obviously layered and, and impacted by, by childhood and, and primary, um, uh, relationships, uh, different points in the lifespan. But, um, I, I think there's a distinction between who a person is and how they behave, obviously. And I think behaviors can change. And I think a lot of the times over time, we think that we, who we are is how we do and how we function things in the world. And it's certainly an impact, but I think that there's something, um, you know, removed from that. And I think sometimes, you know, people have injuries and, you know, they, they, there's things that can change, but, you know, and the people will have, uh, you know, a medication that's prescribed and they can feel more, you know, that, you know, the, uh, the fogginess of things are is lifted and, you know, more of who they really are shines through. And I just think if you just take behavior alone, I think it can answer some things, but I don't think it answers the entire question of who a person is. Now that, that's how I see it. I think, you know, people would argue and they would say, well, that's all you can see. That's all you know. So, you know, and it's not, it lives on an island. It's not removed. And I wouldn't say any of that. I would say that there, it's all connected, but I think there are things with our temperament. I think there are things for us and in, in how we have all various experiences where there's a core element of who we are that is stable through time. And um, I think sometimes we think those are behaviors or actions, but I don't think that they are alone or entirely. Um, so I, this idea of medication saying, well, this is how I was and now I have meds and that's not who I am. What, you know, I'm reconsidering who it is to be me. Uh, I think sort of kind of gets at that is like, yes, we're always discovering aspects of ourself. And I don't think it's always just seen in our behaviors, our actions. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, that's sort of how I, I see some of these things. I'm going to say something strange that I haven't said before, but I'm <laughs> recalling one of uh, the... Uh, things that I did that was most fun as a writer and also the most disappointing. I was, I used ski metaphors in some of my writing and I was asked by a ski magazine if I wanted to write an article. And what we arrived at was that they would arrange some lessons for me to see whether a, an unathletic plateaued intermediate, you know, who learned at middle age and is not, uh, <laughs> 
a natural could could rise above the intermediate plateau. <laughs> so I, when I actually had some lessons on my own dime in Switzerland because I happened to be there to, giving a talk, mm-hmm. and then I was out at uh, in uh, Colorado on the uh, the dime of the ski ski magazine, and uh, had some really interesting lessons. And then somebody thought to put me on these new parabolic skis. Now, all skis now are shaped skis, but this was new Mm. at the time. So I'm forgetting when this is, but say, you know, 20 plus years ago. And I was just better. You know, I could just do things I couldn't do on those, on those skis. I could go on hills I couldn't go on. And, you know, so in terms of behavior, I was behaving like a much better skier <laughs> than I had on the, on the old stick skis. Um, but there was another aspect to it, which was I was braver. Mm. Uh, and, y- you know, it's easier to be brave when you know the skis are going to pull you out of the uh, mm-hmm. fall line and, you know, across the mountain again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so I ju- I, it wasn't just that I could do more. It was that I felt better about myself mm. a, as a skier because um, I was not, you know, as daunted by moguls or steeps or whatever it was. It wasn't all, you know, what you see and so on. It was really that athletically I couldn't do some of those things and now I could do them. And I and I think that is really true for patients, that, you, you know, on these medicines. I, what I observed, of course, immediately was that they were much more open to psychotherapy. They could do things that other before would have been too painful. Uh, they could access thoughts they couldn't before. I talk about the medicines as being, you know, really uh, graceful co-therapists. Mm-hmm. They're helping out with the therapy. But I think it's also true in life that if you're uh, less inhibited socially, you know, of course you can get in trouble, but in general, more good things happen to you mm-hmm. and people respond to you differently. So there's a whole elaboration of what goes on with these medicines. So what's antidepressant isn't just, you know, at the first neuron or neuronal collection, it's what, what, what connection, it's what's going on in therapy and, you know, more it's what's going on in daily life. Um, and people, you know, the whole ethical thing that I write about in listening to Prozac, a lot of it stems from people coming off medicine and they didn't necessarily get depressed again, but they say, you know, I was a better parent mm-hmm. when I was on the medicine. Should I be on this medicine? Mm chronically because I, I was just um, more responsive with my kids or I have a job interview coming up and I know I come across as more confident when I'm on these medicines. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that's where the medical ethics questions uh, come up with this sort of re-prescribing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how, how much it can, it can be a, 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 a difference maker. I mean, it's, yeah, you're talking about skis. I was thinking about, you know, it's like, it's like trying to play tennis with wooden rackets versus the, the kind of modern ones that we use now. This is a world of difference, you know, and the game is different, right? How people uh, hit tennis shots now <laughs> with the different types right. of strings and it was a carbon fiber I think we use now or whatever it is. And yeah, it's we're all different. You know, we can, the game is opened up so much when, you know, it wasn't that way. It would just wooden rackets. Um, so anyways, it's, yeah, I think there's an interesting thing of the tools of the instruments can unlock a lot of things we didn't even know were, were there, which is, which is really powerful, which I, I, I want to ask you about this. And you know, I don't know if you want to get into the weeds of it and maybe you don't, but um, for me, I mean, SSRIs work. I think they, they work generally. I think that they, um, you know, obviously it's going to be different. Everyone's biology is different. Everyone's going to have a different presentation. They're going to have a different, you know, again, biology, you know, it's going to work differently for some people, but they work and you can describe how, how, how they, how they work if you want. There was a paper here. Uh, it was in, it was in nature. It was a review. It's, a. Uh, uh, serotonin theory of depression, systematic umbrella review of the evidence, Moncrief et al., and I'm obviously not going to read it here, but they they did. There's a bunch of meta analyses that they did, and they they looked at um, all all a variety of ones. And the the end point here says the main areas of serotonin research provide no consistent evidence of there being an association between serotonin and depression. 
No support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lower serotonin activity or concentrations. And some evidence was consistent with the possibility that long-term antidepressant use reduces serotonin concentration. Now, I, I can put this in the notes for people to read or whatever. I remember when this came out, I think it was last year. Oh, man. I mean, just everybody everybody was, you know, trashing SSRIs and they're trashing psychiatry and psychology. And this is all a hoax and this doesn't even work. And I just need to take a walk in the woods and do some meditation. And I don't need SSRIs to cure my depression and all the rest of it, the whole thing. And it was really, I mean, it had a bit of some time in the sun for a couple of uh, weeks or months. And people took, I mean, you know, big meta-analyses, you know, it's not something you can just kind of, you know, you know, shy away from. I mean, there was some good, you know, it looks like there was some good data and I'm not doing a deep dive into it. And it's just one study review, but you see these things pop up every now and then. I mean, what, what do you say? And it's current. It's not like it's, you know, 10 years ago. What do you say for people that reject the serotonin hypothesis or antidepressants working or the connection between serotonin and depression uh, currently? What do you, what do you, what do you think about people that make these claims? Well, let me focus on that paper for a minute because it did get a lot of play Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's context as well. So I think that paper is written in extreme bad faith. I mean, it may not, I don't mean to say that the people who write it don't believe it, but it is a paper that, you know, cherry picks. Mm-hmm. But let, let me say what sort of where the areas of bad faith or where there are things that readers might not know about. Mm-hmm. First of all, there is what uh, many psychiatrists call an anti-psychiatry movement. It started in the heyday of psychoanalysis. The complaints were initially that psychoanalysis induced too much conformity, but uh, quickly changed focus to antidepressants. And so this has just been here a long time. And of course, you know, psychologists don't get to prescribe uh, clinical nurse practitioners, uh, social workers don't. And to the extent that there's some interprofessional rivalry, interprofessional, uh, you know, there are reasons to have this posture that depression is just uh, due to life events and uh, poverty and uh, the structure of the culture, and that really we should be focusing on cultural and uh, experiential psychological uh, remedies. Uh, so that's sort of the context that this is not s- sort of neutral in terms of people's wishes for what the data would show. Uh, and, um, you know, in the social media, there are sort of Prozac survivor groups, serotonin mm-hmm. reuptake survivor groups, and mm-hmm. so on. So that there are people who have done poorly or believe they've done poorly on medication mm-hmm. who have sort of an inf- interest as well. And that, uh, you know, gins up an audience for this sort of writing. Mm -hmm. Um, What is wrong with the paper? First of all, that theory that so-called, you know, low serotonin or whatever causes depression has never been a primary theory in psychiatry. In listening to Prozac, you know, 30 years ago, I wrote that that theory is either, you know, partly or wholly wrong. Mm. So this is not exactly stop the press's news that the theory may be wrong because, uh, you know, the book that gave a lot of play to these medications was a book that already said, yeah, that theory isn't likely to explain uh, depression fully and may not explain it partially. The other side of it is that these personality effects, you know, whether altering serotonin can make people more assertive and so on is not in doubt. So the basis for listening to Prozac is not what that paper is about. It's not about does it make you more comfortable socially. Mm-hmm. It's about does it uh, uh, is serotonin linked to the causality of depression. The second thing is the paper says nothing about whether antidepressants work. There are lots of drugs, you know, uh, in the history of medicine where we don't know why they work, but they work. Mm-hmm. So the whole question of whether they work is a different one. And I wrote a book, Ordinarily Well, uh, which is you know a few years old now that talks about the evidence, how we know on the basis of both clinical evidence and this more objective evidence-based medicine type of evidence that antidepressants work. People can read that, but it's a kind of a book length refutation of these drugs are just uh, placebos. But the last thing is that paper really mistakes the role of serotonin in uh, depression research. Researchers remain very interested in problems with depression transmission as, <clears throat> excuse me, an element 
in the development or maintenance of depression. And uh, in the afterward, the new afterward to the 30th anniversary edition of Listening to Prozac, <laughs> I, uh, you know, write at length about what that, re what the research is that, that was overlooked. Mm -hmm. But it looks as if patients who are less able to, uh, you know, maintain good uh, brain usage of serotonin are more at risk for uh, depression or likely to stay depressed. And there is absolutely cutting edge research, which now can look right into the brains of living human beings and see how they handle serotonin, which is, is tending to, uh, I, I would say that those old theories that we've always had doubts about, and ordinarily, well, you know, in listening to Prozac 30 years ago, I said that that theory was held in doubt by the field. And ordinarily, well, I go back to the early 1960s. Hmm. So we're talking about uh, now, you know, 60 plus years, where the field clearly said, this is not a well-established theory. Hmm. We have reasons to doubt it. So, you know, and, and I think that the problem with reporting on these papers is that newspapers don't anymore have dedicated uh, science reporters, yeah. medical reporters, much less mental health medical <laughs> reporters. I mean, it's just that the funding for the press has greatly diminished. Uh, people write articles out of the press releases from the people who write the <laughs> papers. Mm -hmm. and you know, there's just more interest in journalism in general and being a muckraker, being anti-establishment, mm -hmm. you know, doing all the president's men. And the equivalent in mental health is uh, doubting, uh, you know, mainstream theories in uh, psychiatry. So mm -hmm. I think journalists love this. And uh, as a result, that paper didn't get the sort of critical scrutiny it, it should have gotten. Mm -hmm. So that's a long answer, but I think it contains some other information about, mm -hmm. you know, how, with what level of belief or skepticism mm. you should look at reporting mm. uh, in the press. And just parenthetically, this is not, I have an article in STAT that's out now, it's up now, the uh, Boston Journal's uh, Science Medical uh, uh, Online uh, paper and a, a discussion about it in a different podcast. And in it, uh, Rachel Aviv, who's a New Yorker journalist, uh, you know, uh, I, I refer to uh, uh, her, her recent book and some articles where she's very critical of psychiatry, very skeptical. But when it comes to herself, uh, she says that she was on a serotonin uptake inhibitor. And when on it, this is some years ago, she decided to have a baby and she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, uh, she thought she should come off the antidepressant so it wouldn't affect the fetus. Mm -hmm. And when she came off the antidepressant, she couldn't remember anymore why she wanted to have a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, so she had to kind of go back on it and did. And, uh, but is continually trying to come off it. And when she comes off it, she finds she's a less good parent mm -hmm. and wants to be back on it again for, for family reasons. So I think it's possible to be very skeptical about psychiatry and then nevertheless in your personal experience, uh, be very aware of how um, effective in certain ways these, these medicines are. In, in uh, ordinarily, well, I have a number of other stories like that where you know, throughout history, there are people who've been very skeptical and doubting of antidepressants and then personally benefited from them very greatly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I can see maybe some of the uh, the trollish comments here when, once I post this. You know, well, Dr. Kramer is just a, he's a he's a he's a, he's a, sh a shill for a big farmer. That's what big farmers telling him to say all these nice things about SSRIs and all this well, stuff, right? Let, let me tell you about me and big farmer. So the British Medical <laughs> Journal has kept a list for many years of doctors who are in the public eye and who don't take any money from drug companies, and I have been on that list. Uh, since it uh, continuously since it started, and you know, if it had been made earlier, I you know, when I wrote "Listen Your Prozac," I paid for my own plane when I went out and interviewed uh, Eli Lilly scientists. I paid for my <laughs> lunch in the cafeteria. <laughs> I have you know not just 
not on the payroll of anyone but myself. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah, of course, I'm only teasing. But, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, though, how people will, you know, you show some good evidence and all these things. And then, you know, when, when they run out of, you know, kind of their arguments, they start making the ad hominems. And it's just like, oh, goodness, you know, it's it's. And normally, you know, one or two people, but unfortunately nowadays, you just get a lot of folks that do this kind of stuff and they're very loud and they get a lot of attention. And it's, again, I, I saw this stuff with this to one another. They're all on, you know, they're all on each other's Twitter and blue sky feeds right, and right, Instagram. Right, and right, right. So on, so that if one says it's, it's a cascade, yeah. on, right, 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 right. Yeah. right. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, so, you, so we jump a little bit now because it might make sense here. Uh, is this some... Um, Kind of the way you were mentioning about in the afterword of of the book, the the, the new edition, uh, we we have these many theories as you were talking about. We've had the kindling theory model, excuse me, which you talk about in the book, uh, catecholamine theory, serotonin, which you just talked about, many other theories about depression, and then what's the effectiveness of of antidepressants. But um, in in more current research, you talk about uh, some of the work with BDNF and with uh, TKRB. Uh, it's a uh, very, I love this. I love the afterwards, not just cause it's new and you just wrote it, but mo- <laughs> it's, it feels there's more current research that's being done. So I guess just maybe generally give us the kind of broad sweep of like, we've had these theories, you know, kind of what we, what the thought was as it goes on in the evolution of it, but where we're currently at with how we think about how depression works and, and how antidepressants work with it. Yeah. So these theories, uh, there have been different theories coming to the fore over time. Uh, they have been, I would say, cumulative, adding to one another. There hasn't been any big aha moment like what the Moncrief paper would suggest. Where we think, oh, we have to toss that one out entirely. Uh, you know, this new one is taking over. Kindling has to do with the idea that the more you have depression, the more it gets unmoored from external causation. So early episodes tend to be um, uh, related to terrible losses or, or injuries or disappointments, but later ones may seem to come on out of the blue. So that's the, the kindling. And we talked a little about it. serotonin is a, a catecholamine. We talked a little about that. There is this new strange theory uh, which says that an entirely other chemical is really involved in, not in these personality effects, but in the antidepressant effects of uh, the serotonin uptake inhibitors and also probably the psychedelics and some other drugs. And, uh, and that, that, is, that is, you know, very interesting and, um, you know, I'd say confusing. I think it's not well worked out. We'll, we'll see how, how all these, uh, you know, different chemical notions of causation uh, hook up. I think we'll, we'll know uh, in, in not too long a time. But... Th- those later recent theories, whether they have to do with drugs like Pro, uh, Prozac, or whether they have to do with serotonin receptors or these track B receptors, have to do with resilience. Mm. And the idea is that these medicines get you out of being stuck. So people, when people are depressed, they're not really able to do new learning, right? They're going around in circles, having the same self-destructive thoughts, and they're they're not able to stop and see things from a fresh perspective. And the idea is that these medicines allow for new cells, new connections between cells in the brain, and as a result, allow for new learning. Uh, the model of this has to do with, um, best worked out model, has to do with amblyopia, which is where you start, stop getting the use of one eye, you're only using one eye well, and uh, you don't get uh, stereoscopic vision based on your brain coordinating what your two eyes are doing. And the way people get that typically is, say, in infancy at the critical period for developing these uh, capacities in the brain of vision, a uh, child has a problem with an eye, the eye has to be patched, and the brain stops recognizing signals from that eye and is only using the other eye. And in mice, you can obviously do that at will or rats. And um, in adult rodents, it's possible with Prozac to restore that critical period. So what you do is you give Prozac, you patch the working eye, give you the non-working eye, uh, eye that's working less well, chance to uh, hook up with the brain again, and then you remove the patch and the rat or mouse has uh, stereoscopic vision again. 
And it looks like some of that happens in people. It's the, the results are less dramatic in people. Uh, it's harder to do the research for various reasons because the uh, places you do the research demand that you do a certain amount of eye training and education in both arms of the study. And some people get better with that alone. But anyway, the, um, you know, that is the idea of new learning, really dramatic new learning uh, at, at that level. And the idea is that uh, the same sort of thing is happening in mood disorders. And the, you know, the more elaborated form of that theory is that maybe what's going on with these medicines is that on the one hand, they um, make new learning possible. And on the other, they affect the bias, the emotional bias with which you see the world. So you're a little more optimistic. You're a little more willing to think good things about yourself at the very time that you're able to do new learning. And that that combination of effects may be what makes, you know, all of these quite different uh, antidepressants, um, you know, able to combat depression. Yeah, I think that's, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it sounds like a, a wide future here of, of where we're going with, with what we can learn mostly about the, the neurochemistry in the brain and how, how things are functioning and how these, this kind of resilience as you're talking about. I do before I ask my my last question. I I, I do want to ask just as a as a kind of maybe uh, footnote here because it, it did come up initially and kind of bounces around every now and then. It, is this suicidality associated with with Prozac that there's a little bit of an increase? I mean, how how much of that is a, is a genuine worry? Uh, people that will say, well, I don't want to take that because you know I don't want to I don't want to be suicidal or something like. You know what, what do we what do we know about that now that's been in, in so use. Yeah, I mean, people imagine I said the opposite of what I say in listening to Prozac. So listening to Prozac, you know, pretty early in 1993. uh, And I say that I think that some people get more suicidal on Prozac. So that, you know, it's not new. Uh, Before I wrote the book, uh, there was some observation at McLean Hospital in Boston of a series of, you know, seven or eight patients who seem to have more suicidal thoughts on these medicines than not. Now, it was a complicated group. Not all of them probably were having that particular phenomenon, but you know, a few of them maybe were. And I think that is the case, that some people get more suicidal. The early theory was that they um, get suicidal because the medicine makes them kind of more agitated in some way, more needing to walk around. Uh, and um, mobilizes them. I, I said at the time that I thought there might be some, you know, real underlying reason why they get more suicidal. That's sort of a direct emotional effect, a direct effect on suicidality. Now, I think that these medicines may have saved many, many more lives than they have, uh, you know, lo- lost. Um, in general, you know, there were studies of counties or countries that were similar and introduced Prozac at a certain moment and saw a decrease in uh, suicidality relative to a, you know, a comparable place that hadn't had these medicines introduced yet. Uh, There's a lot of dispute about that. But, um, you know, I, I had a very privileged practice. I saw people in psychotherapy once a week, almost always, you know, occasionally more often. But rarely less and never less if I was introducing medication. And I think, you know, in a, in a well-regulated practice, you can put people on these medicines and if things start going wrong, count on the patient or the family to notify you or be seeing the patient regularly. And um, I, I don't think the risk is very high. There's a lot of controversy about this in the field and certainly the anti-psychiatry movement uh, this particular doctor who has a lot of data on this, interest in this, David Healy in the United Kingdom. And, uh, you know, he, he thinks that this problem is bigger than I do. I'd say we're probably polar opposites in that regard. But I, I don't dismiss it entirely. There are people who get more suicidal on these medicines. Mm, yeah, yeah. I know sometimes it pops up, so I, I definitely wanted to bring it up. Right. And I think diagnosis is an issue. You know, you want to know you're treating depression or obsessionality. Manic depression is just harder in every way. And if a patient is 
manic depressive and you just give uh, an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer, there's a lot of dispute in the field about how dangerous that is. Some people are stabilized by the antidepressants, but you know, I think that diagnosis is an issue. Well, you yeah. don't know what it is you're treating uh, or being treated for. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one thing about that real quick. I, I, I have uh, evolved opinions about diagnosis uh, generally over the past couple of years. I think that it's overemphasized now. Um, and I don't think we should underemphasize it, but I think people get stuck on a label and a diagnosis. And I think it's, you know, again, I, <laughs> I'm an old Freudian, right? I, I, they're important to a point. We're, we're, <laughs> so we're in agreement about that, you know, in the afterward. Mm -hmm. I talk about patients coming into bed, multiple drugs. And the reason there are multiple drugs is they have multiple diagnoses. Right. And I think, yeah, yeah there's something mm -hmm. basically wrong. Let's just kind of think about what's wrong at core and not treat right. every diagnosis that's in the book just because it's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I firmly, fully, fully agree with you there. I will say, though, there is a little bit of a caveat here, which is, you know, kind of with uh, bipolar, uh, you know, with, with, with bipolar uh, two, especially um, many times you see the, you don't see the hypomania and you just see the depression and you can see the depression, you know, present, you know, kind of just as a, you'd say, oh, this person's depressed. And many times they don't get a bipolar two diagnosis. Right? Um, and so you're treating a depression and, and what can happen is, is that if you're, Diagnose someone with depression. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but and they in fact do have a, a, um, a bipolar, a bipolar two. Um, you know, anti certain antidepressants can be, uh, I would say, harmful, but they can be difficult for people that have bipolar. And some maybe suicidality, things like that. And so sometimes I think to diagnosis accurately for, as you were saying, with with bipolar disorders one or two is really important because there is a kind of mixture of, you know, what is the effect that antidepressants can have on someone that has bipolar one or two that does it exacerbate some symptoms, et cetera. And I think for something like that, it is, uh, you know, probably important to kind of, you know, maybe sit with a little bit on the differential to, to get it right. Cause you don't want to have any inadvert, uh, you know, exacerbation of symptoms. So that, that's where, that's an example of kind of what you're saying with the bipolar piece. Right. So, yeah. Um, Good. so yeah, so, so let's, uh, the last question here is, uh, you know, where you, in 30 years, you know, when, when we get the 60th anniversary of, uh, listening to, <laughs> listening to Prozac, right. Where, <laughs> where do you, you don't have to, you know, no fortune telling, no prediction, something like that, but where do you see the future of SSRIs? Um, and, and, you know, and, and generally of, of where they're going, do, do we, do we make this pivot to psychedelics, you know, psilocybin, MDMA, you know, marijuana, things like that, or, you know, do we find new drugs is, is more of the, the neuro, uh, aspects in neuroscience help us out here? Where do you think the future I, is here? I, I mean, I, I think psychiatry as a field should be able to do much better. <laughs> And uh, I hope it doesn't take 30 years. <laughs> I think the combination of G DNA sequencing and gene sequencing and uh, AI should be interesting. I mean, it may be that there are going to be patterns where we'll just know better how to treat people. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and, and certainly AI and drug development should be interesting. So we'll see. Uh, I mean, gene sequencing didn't bring us the uh, big effects anywhere in medicine. Uh, for a number of years, so maybe the same will be true of AI. But um, I, I think the field should manage to do better altogether. As for the role of SSRIs, you know, they're pretty good. They're pretty well tolerated. Their success rate is much higher than what you read about in the press. And uh, maybe I'd, I, I, I'd like to be healthy enough to write another <laughs> introduction afterwards in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't surprise me if the SSRI st still had a pretty big role. Mm. Um, but I'm, you know, very open to something better, much better coming along. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very nice. said. Well, the book is Listening to Prozac, landmark book about antidepressants and the remaking of the self. That's uh, out everywhere, the 30th anniversary, new introduction, new afterward. Uh, it's all fabulous. Peter. Thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast again. You're always welcome here. I always love getting your wisdom and always having such a good conversation. So big, big, big thanks. Thank you. This is great.